This week, I interview Trader and StockScores.com founder Tyler Bullhorn. Don't be impulsive. You know, I think when you're younger, I started trading when I was 19, you, you make fast decisions because you have a fear of missing out, you want to maximize your profit. It's really kind of greed and fear put together. Uh, you know, we talk about professional athletes and actors and actresses and the millions that they make. That really pales in comparison to what top traders make. Um, you know, there's traders that have made over a billion dollars in a year and you won't find Tiger Woods making that kind of money, you know. With that said, realize that it doesn't happen overnight. You don't go into an occupation and expect to make, you know, the highest level of pay for that occupation unless you've gathered some experience. Most people want to become millionaires overnight. And of course, if you have that mindset, rarely does it happen. From the outside looking in, it can sometimes appear that peak performers have an elusive talent or skill that sets them apart from the rest of us. However, what usually sets peak performers apart isn't what they can do, it's what they will do. You are listening to the Trading Edges podcast, the podcast dedicated to seeking and sharing the best ideas and principles from peak performers across all domains of performance and achievement to help you discover your full trading potential. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is Houston, and welcome to the 11th episode of Trading Edges, brought to you by thetradingedge.org. Thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of the show. We've got a lot more on the way, so head on over to the blog at thetradingedge.org and subscribe to our newsletter to stay in touch and get insider access to content you won't find anywhere else. Now, let's talk about this week's show. Tyler Bullhorn is the guest on this week's show, and it's a great show. Tyler is a trader and founder of StockScores.com, and he's a frequent speaker on the Money Show circuit. Now, in this show, we cover a ton of topics, which I think you're going to enjoy. But as I reflect back on our conversation, the one idea that really sticks out to me happens near the end of the conversation, when Tyler talks about the importance of just having fun. To par paraphrase Tyler, if you're not having fun, then you're probably struggling and you need to evaluate what you're doing. As I've spoken with other guests in the past, fun is such an important element to the learning process. So let that be your, my, our orientation because the greatest achievers in any field use fun as a lever for performance. Anyways, it's a topic that I think we're going to probably explore a lot more in the future. But for now, let's get on to the interview. As always, you can find the show notes, transcript, and resources at thetradingedge.org backslash episode 11. And if you're enjoying these podcasts, please drop us a line and leave us a review on iTunes. All right. Hi, Tyler. Thanks so much for joining the show today. Good to be with you. Absolutely. Now, just a bit of an inside scoop. Tyler's actually calling in from Maui, so um, th there's a substantial kind of <laughs> a difference in time zones. So I just want to first acknowledge and thank Tyler for staying up a bit late <laughs> or getting up a bit early and staying out, staying throughout the day to, to do this podcast. Hey, no problem. I'm uh, staring at the ocean out my window, so it's not <laughs> a bad thing to be doing. <laughs> All right. So just a, as a way of a quick intro, and I'll get Tyler to talk more about himself in a few moments, but... Tyler's been trading the financial, the financial markets for about 25 years. You'll often find him speaking on circuits like, or, uh, like The Money Show and speaking on BNN, as well as coaching and mentoring other traders. But what really drew me to, to Tyler is that I found about Tyler about 10 years ago when I first started my trading journey. And he really has a, an approach, I think that's quite methodical, and that's, that really works for him. And I'm going to ask him to maybe talk more about his background and his approach um, so why don't we start there, Tyler? Tell us more about you know how you got started with trading, and what's your approach to trading the markets nowadays? Sure, I was a student at the University of Calgary uh, 
uh, I guess 25 years ago, and uh, started by playing a stock simulation game where you know you bought and sold stocks in with pretend money, and uh, it was sort of part of what I was doing in school, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Mm. I also hung around uh, being in Calgary. We, you know, had a group of friends who all traded penny stocks in the in the uh, very speculative area, uh, mining and energy stocks, and you know, we were all kind of broke students with not a lot of money, and that was sort of what we did for fun. And and uh, some of those guys were pretty good at picking stocks, and I sort of got enamored with the idea that I could make money. Uh, far more easily than um, if I was, uh, you know, actually working for a living. So, <laughs> right. um, you know, that's kind of what captured my interest. Now, in the beginning, I did what I was taught to do in school, um, which is find good fundamentals and look at earnings and management and all that kind of stuff. But I found that that really didn't work all that well. And so I sort of just by luck happened upon a guy who... Uh, who was doing technical analysis and keep in mind 25 years ago technical analysis was not something that many people did mm -hmm. and we almost looked at it like it was a weird thing to do and we kind of laughed at this guy when we first started seeing him drawing out lines on charts because again back then you didn't have the internet where you could look at charts you had to actually draw them out by hand um, but he was really good at picking stocks so I kind of took an interest in that and mm. then started developing my own methods revolving around abnormal trading activity. I used to hang out at the Alberta Stock Exchange and um, they, there they had real-time quote feeds uh, on some computers outside the exchange mm. and I would just sit there and look for abnormal stock movers and uh, race home and, and I had a charting service where I could download one chart at a time over <laughs> the very early stage of the internet and uh, it took forever but you know I, that's kind of how I started and just carried on from there. But, you know, interestingly enough, what I do today is still based on the abnormal trading activity that I was doing when I was in my early 20s hmm. sitting at the Alberta Stock Exchange. That hasn't changed. So what is the philosophy around, around that? So you're looking for, and we kind of talked about this before the call today, but you're looking for abnormal patterns in stocks? Not necessarily abnormal patterns, but abnormal trading activity. Mm -hmm. So if a stock normally trades a million shares a day and then one day it trades five million shares a day, that would be abnormal. Okay. If a stock normally moves up or down 1% in a day typically, but then one day it moves up 7% in a day, that would be abnormal. And my philosophy is that the stock market isn't fair, that uh, there's always going to be some people that have better information about what a company is doing than others. Yeah. And with that better information, they can uh, have an edge in the market, yep. um, predict where those stocks are going to go. So I'm really just trying to follow those well-informed people, those who really know the company well, know the sector very well. Because when they act aggressively in the market, when they have some new information that really justifies paying a higher price or accepting a lower price, um, they will do so quite aggressively mm -hmm. and that creates the abnormal activity. So. I wrote some computer algorithms many years ago that look for abnormal trading activity and and once I have that list of abnormal stocks then I monitor them for patterns and uh, so it's sort of abnormal activity plus predictive ch chart patterns is how I pick my entry and exit points. Okay and that applies across all time frames right so whether you're talking about day trading or swing trading or position trading you're looking for the same type of abnormal activity followed by some sort of technical setup for your entries and exits? Yes. Um, you know, the philosophy on how I day trade on a two-minute chart is not a whole lot different than how I would position trade on a daily or weekly chart. Hmm. Um, the execution's a little different. You have to obviously think quicker when you're day trading. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it all revolves around abnormal activity from predictive chart patterns, whether you're two-minute chart or a weekly chart. Interesting. And so what do you say to those folks who say, you know, oh, technical analysis is a bunch of, you know, uh, witchcraft it's you know just a bunch of self-fulfilling prophecy you've been in the game for a long time you've been able to you know to eke out success so you know where do you stand when you hear that type of you know reasoning well you know I've encountered a lot of people that do technical analysis and I have encountered a ton of people that really don't do it very well <laughs> uh, so I I can understand where the skepticism comes from I mean how can you predict markets based on lines on a chart I, I get that yeah I don't really consider myself a technical ana analyst. I don't use indicators except my own. Yeah. Um, you won't ever see me talk about a MACD or a stochastic 
and, and maybe there's um, credibility to those things. I just don't use them. I only use chart patterns. Right. Um, I basically look for uh, rising bottoms, falling tops, support resistance, price volatility, and abnormal activity. It's six things that are the basis for every trade I do. Hmm. Um, but with that said, you can be the best chart analyst in the world. doesn't mean you're going to make any money because the most important part of trading well is risk management. Mm -hmm. And so I also use chart analysis for risk management, knowing where um, my exit points are if I'm wrong, knowing where the stock will likely get stuck, knowing where it will reverse. That's all part of the risk management um, calculation. Yeah. And I think that is more important. You know, when I was a student uh, in university, I was a pretty good stock picker. I, I knew how to find the hot stocks because it's actually not that hard. Um, but I wasn't a great risk manager. Mm. So, you know, I paid my way through school, but I wasn't getting rich. And it was only probably after eight years of trading that I really started to focus on the risk management side and building big positions when I'm right and taking small losses when I'm wrong. Those are important things. That's very well said. So was there some sort of turning point that, that kind of, you know, was that kind of, you know, turning point that allowed you to, to become very, very successful? Or was it just a lot of small incremental gains that, that generated that success? I think it's about changing your mindset from a gambler to a trader. Hmm. Uh, gamblers don't trade expected value. They just, right. you know, throw money on a stock and hope that it works out. They want to win. And so, <laughs> yeah, I'm very much a strategy trader. So I come up with a set of rules for when to buy, when to sell. Yeah. I test those rules, both back testing, but also with real money without a lot of risk. And after I've tested something, I can say, okay, if I do this strategy, this set of rules 100 times, I know that I make money 67% of the time and my average profit is twice as large as my average, average loss. So that's what I mean when I say I'm a strategy trader or I trade expected value. Um, a, a gambler trader who might fool themselves into thinking they're a trader, but in fact they are a gambler, will say, oh, I heard a tip about XYZ company that uh, someone on TV said it's a great company, I'm going to buy it. And they really don't know anything more than what that person told them. And so they're, they're not trading expected value, they're just you know, gambling as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So I think it, there was a time when I listened to stories, company stories, and uh, sometimes it would work, I'd have big wins and then other times it wouldn't work and I'd have big losses and it was just kind of a vicious cycle where I basically went up and down with the trend of the market. Right. Um, and now my focus is entirely on strategies. I don't watch TV, I don't uh, read the newspaper, I don't look around on you know, chat websites and like that. I just yeah. follow market activity and that's ultimately the truth because people um, vote with their money in the market and you see what they're actually doing with their money as opposed to what they're talking about. Right, that's very well said. So we've talked about some of these elements already. So where do you find a lot of traders getting tripped up? Like we talked about how they're kind of, a lot of traders, especially when they first start out, are, are very, very, um, I guess they're just interested in setups and, and like you said, maybe the narrative of a company. Where else are traders getting tripped up as, you know, as they move from simply beginner to to more intermediate stages? Well, so let's assume that you're a really good either fundamental or technical analyst. Yeah. You know how to do that well. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, I don't think that means you're going to make money. You have to be a good risk manager. A lot of people aren't, mm. so they don't manage risk very effectively. But most, the most common problem, I think, is succumbing to fear, whether it's the fear of losing money, the fear of missing out, um, the fear of uh, being wrong. There's, there's all these fears that come into our heads which cause us to make mistakes. Right. Uh, I, I could write down the rules for one of my trading strategies on the back of a napkin in, you know, in 20 seconds. But I could then publish those rules on the cover of the Wall Street Journal and most people still wouldn't make money with them right. because they succumb to their fear. Um, and so you have to be able to overcome that. So one of the common things is just the fear of missing out, which causes people to take marginal trades. They'll see a stock that looks pretty good, kind of kind of looks like it wants to go up and it doesn't really meet their rules, but they'll take it anyway because yeah. they don't want to, you know, the next day be saying, oh, if I would have bought that stock, I would have made $5,000 today. And so they end up taking marginal trades. And right. 
I think that's what happens a lot with experienced traders is they have the fear of missing out and they take a lot of marginal trades or, mm -hmm. or they don't sell when the market tells them to sell because they don't want that uh, winner to turn into a bigger winner. Right. And so, you know, you work with a lot of traders, you know, from a mentoring and coaching perspective. How do you begin to shift that mindset? How do you get traders to, to better manage those emotions? If we know that that's just kind of part of the game, how do you begin to manage that? I think there's two ways to overcome your emotion, two important ways, there's many ways, but the two important ways are one, to have a written plan, mm. and two, to not take on more risk than you're comfortable with or accepting of. And the, the, the enemy, I guess, is yourself. Right. Um, you will make mistakes in trading if you take on too much risk because you can't handle the loss. All right. So let's say you have a $100,000 portfolio. Um, mathematically, you think, okay, I should be able to take a $1,000 loss. Mentally, you may say, well, anything more than a $500 loss makes me uncomfortable. I can't sleep well at night on that. And so if you then take a trade where your, your risk of that trade is $1,500, $2,000, if, you know, if you get stopped out, for example, yeah. uh, it's very likely that when the stock gets to the stop loss point, you won't take the loss. You will find every reason in the chart You'll, you'll look for things that aren't even there yeah. to convince yourself that the trade is worth sticking with. And uh, the result then is you end up taking a bigger loss than you had planned for. Um, and so I think it's real important to understand what your tolerance for risk is and let that determine your position size. Mm. And also to have that written plan so that in those moments of emotion, you have something written to go back to, a written process a step by step, this is how I execute my buys, this is how I execute my risk management, this is how I execute my exit strategy. And it should be something so specific on a one page plan that you could basically program a computer to do the same thing. Right. If, if you were a, comp a computer programmer. So yeah. you don't want to leave any room for judgment or as little as possible. And if you can do those things, well, you're part way there. But at the end of the day, you also have to desensitize yourself to risk. And that just comes with time. Yeah, it's kind of funny how powerful confirmation bias is. <laughs> if, yeah, uh, exactly. You, you know, you, you can definitely find a story in anything to, to confirm or, or disprove <laughs> your, your opinions. Yeah. So it is, yeah. it's one of those things with you about being a human. Um, so talk about more about desensitizing. It, like you said, is it just a matter of getting the hours and just getting the screen time and just taking the trades over and over again until you, you can just marginally increase the level of risk until you get comfortable? Is that uh, the approach that you yeah, think, I think works? I think that's what you have to do is, is get to the point where you don't care about the money. Yeah. And uh, you know what I always tell my students to do is start by trading in a simulator. So I built a simulator that my students can use where they can fake trade, but it's quite realistic. You can't cheat at it. You know, you're yeah. actually buying and selling on a, on a website that I built, tradescores.com. And once you've done that to the point where you've made 10 times your risk amount, so let's say on, on paper you're risking $500. If you make $5,000 on paper, then you're ready to start trading for real. And perhaps when you trade for real, you're going to start with a risk tolerance of $100 per trade. And once you've made $1,000 at that level, now you're ready to move your risk tolerance up to $200 per trade. And I want to state that when I talk about risk tolerance, that's not the position size. You're not buying $100 worth of stock. Right. The risk tolerance is the difference between your entry price and your exit price multiplied by the number of shares that you buy or sell. Right. So, you know, that's basically how much you're going to lose on the trade if you get stopped out. And uh, it's that kind of process where you gradually start moving up. Um, most people don't have the patience for that. Most mm -hmm. people want to become millionaires overnight. And, of course... If you have that mindset, rarely does it happen. <laughs> you know, you, you have to get there slowly and carefully and, you know, recognize that trading is the most, um, it's, it's the highest paid occupation that I know of. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about professional athletes and actors and actresses and the millions that they make. That really pales in comparison to what top traders make. Um, you know, there's traders that have made over a billion dollars in a year. And you won't find Tiger Woods making that kind of money, you know. So yeah. with that said, realize that it doesn't happen overnight. You don't go into an occupation and expect to make, you know, the highest level of pay for that occupation unless you've gathered some experience. You know, when you come out of law school, you're not going to make half a million dollars a year. You're going to get paid next to nothing and learn, right? Mm. 
And the same can be said for trading. So you have to go into trading saying, okay, my goal is to be a trader. And for my first year, I might lose money. My second year, I might break even. My third year, I might start to make some money. And, you know, maybe in four or five years, I will be achieving the kind of uh, income that I want to, to have. And it's kind of like going to university to get a degree so that you can get a job in something. Here, you're going to stock market university. It's self-guided. Uh, tuition is expensive potentially. The uh, the market is cruel. It gives the test first and the lesson second. Mm, I like that. But but when you uh, if you just take that big picture view of it, then you have reasonable expectations of becoming a trader. Yeah. It doesn't take everyone five years. Some people get trading in six months. Other people never get it. And uh, it's just a matter of, of having a realistic expectation for what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's a that's a powerful comment. And you know, expectations are. Or one of those things where I think you know the financial media does a very good job at selling the dream of trading, and then we see what happens is that you know people go in in a very unstructured environment. They try to to uh, you know to impose their will on it, and re really all that happens is that they just act like bulls in a china shop, and it usually doesn't turn out well. So, what is a reasonable expectation for traders? Like, are do you have like milestones that people should be hitting or, or be thinking about as they progress from you know? new trader to someone a little bit more competent to, to more competent to, to more competent? Do you have any ideas around that? Well, I think it's dangerous to have expectations mm. because there's, a, there's an element that's out of your control and that is what the market is doing. Mm. You know, if, if I say, okay, I want to make $100,000 this month and I say that's my goal and I put a little sticky note on my computer screen, right. I'm probably not going to achieve that Yeah. because now what you're doing is you're putting the emphasis on the money as opposed to putting the emphasis on the the process and the rules. Yeah. You can only do what the market gives you. You know, today there wasn't a lot of good trading opportunities unless you're trading the, the VIX, which is what I was doing. Um, yesterday there was one good day trader, but it was a great mover. And at the open in the first hour, there was nothing. I sat here, um, you know, because I'm in Hawaii, I was sat in the dark <laughs> in the early morning. And uh, I thought, why did I even get out of bed? Like there's just nothing going on. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you know, one stock comes alive and it ends up having a great move through the day. And uh, I don't control that. You know, I don't get to work harder to make more money. So my point is don't have expectations. Don't set goals, uh, at least around money. Set goals like uh, I will follow my rules. I will be disciplined. I will take losses when the market tells me to take losses. Those are the kind of goals that you want to do. Yeah. Uh, you, one of your goals might be to say, I'm going to look at a thousand charts this week so you can really learn how to feel the chart and understand that. But don't have a goal of, I want to make 21% this year. Um, that's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's such an important lesson there around focusing on the process versus the outcome. Because the outcome, like you said, is it's definitely not controllable, especially since the markets, for the most part, are, are random. So. You know, especially if your system, if you expect your system is going to have a positive expectancy, even then you can never tell how it's going to play out. So, so yeah. to try to force it to happen in in seven days or fourteen days or thirty days is is certainly unrealistic. Yeah, you know, in life we're taught to work hard, and, right. and when the going gets tough, work harder. Work harder. I like to tell people <laughs> when the going gets tough, good traders get lazy. Yeah, I like and, that. You know, you work hard when the market's easy. Yeah. And when there's a steady flow of trades and there's trend and there's follow through, that's when you work hard. If the market is tough, you're better just to turn off the screen or, or not try very hard. So true. And that's a hard thing for people to yeah. do because of how, how society programs us. Yeah, so, so true. And there's also that element of scarcity. I think a lot of traders, you know, when they, when they uh, show up to the markets, they, are, they already have that in their mindset. Like they have to make something happen. Right, like I need to be a good trader so that I can, you know, buy this or that, or so that I can quit my job, or so that I can provide for such and such. That level of scarcity going into trading puts again another very difficult layer of expectations on a trader to try to make something happen. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all the emotional sides of trading, and yeah. I always say that if you're a normal human being, you're predisposed to fail in the stock market, <laughs> right? Um, because normal <laughs> human beings do all those things that you're talking about, and yeah. we. You know, we dream of the big win, we fear the big loss, we fear missing out, yeah. um, and it's that human element that makes us uh, make mistakes. And so what's the, like, you know, you said in the beginning, like, unfortunately for for a lot of traders in the stock market in general is that there is no kind of um, 
hard and fast rules around the learning, around how to learn how to trade. A lot of it is, is, is unstructured, unguided, and you kind of need to figure out on your by yourself where you're kind of making mistakes and how you can improve. Um, do you find like is that trade plan the most important place to to you know begin to collect your thoughts and and to improve as a trader? What kind of tools or tactics do you use to make sure you have that really positive feedback loop where you're learning from mistakes and and getting better? Well, you know, at the end of every day, and again, I primarily day trade. I write newsletters where I focus on position trading. But yeah. for me personally, I, I primarily day and swing trade, so mm. pretty short term. Yeah. So at the end of every day, at the end of every week, I um, run through my computer models and say, what are all the trades that I should have made if I was perfect? And by the way, I don't expect to be perfect. And, and a lot of the lessons I'm talking about today come because I'm far from perfect. Mm. I make lots of mistakes. But anyway, so at the end of the day, I'll say, okay, if I had followed my rules perfectly, and it's very mathematically driven, so it's pretty easy to say, I should have bought these four stocks, and, and I should have made X or lost X. And then I compare that with what I actually did, and I try to do some self-analysis on what did I do wrong. A lot of times, it's just bad focus. You know, it's easy to miss something. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes it's getting your emotions involved. Sometimes it's, you know, listening too much to common sense and saying, well, I know this company, it's such a piece of junk, I've, I've traded it before, I've lost money on it before, so I'm going to ignore this trade because mm-hmm. uh, I know the company's a piece of junk. And then that stock ends up doing really well. So <laughs> right. you can't have those judgments, right? Yeah. Um, and then at the end of every week, I look at what are the swing trades I should have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a little scan I do which shows me the top 10 uh, or the top movers over the last 10 days and I go through that list and you know a lot of them I wouldn't have traded, but those that I, I either did trade or should have traded. I'll just, you know, test myself to see did I execute this trade properly. Quite truthfully, rarely do I execute anything perfectly. I mean, I just it's unrealistic to think that and I I one thing I would like to stress to people is you shouldn't try to be perfect because that will um and cause you to end up blowing up. Um but uh that's a way to just keep confirming my rules and and if you find that your rules just aren't working day after day after day, then maybe it's time to modify them, but yeah. Um it also typically for me it just says, yes, the rules that you have do work. You got to believe in them, and you got to execute them properly, because every day, every week, every month, I show myself through that process that my rules work. And you know, sometimes I find ways to change my rules, which is another way to improve my overall trading yeah. performance. Yeah, this chat really reminds me of that saying by John Maxwell. He says, uh, "Failure isn't the best teacher, and neither is experience. It's evaluated experience." So you know, going back and not just you know using failure as your, you know, as as that kind of milestone, but rather going back and kind of tweaking things and and, and seeing where things are working, where things are not working. Do you still, or have you ever used something like a trade journal? And do you still use a trade journal to to capture ideas? What's your what's your thoughts around that? <laughs> well, I I tell all my students that they have to do a trade journal. Right. And it's the case of. Uh, <laughs> I don't do what I tell my students. <laughs> do I as I say, <laughs> not as I do. Yeah, that's right. I I don't write it down. I don't you know mark up charts and put them in a book like I tell people to. But yeah. I, keep in mind that I've done this for twenty five years, exactly. so I I can look at a chart and know exactly where my entry and exit points are. I yeah. sort of I've become lazy to doing that. But with that said, I still every day go through the charts that I I should have traded, and um, I may not you know, print out the charts and put them in a book, but I go through the analysis and, and just to confirm different thoughts. And, you know, if I see myself making some mistakes on a recurring basis, I'll often uh, put a little reminder on a post-it note and stick it to my screen, you know, to get myself back on track. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing the process. I just don't actually do it the way I teach people to do it. No, and it sounds like you have a really good routine or a set of habits to just kind of ingrain what you want to do more of. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, you have to have process. Process yeah. is essential because that's what keeps you on track. And step by step, this is what I do at this time of day. This is what I do next. And that's how I sort of set myself up each day. Yeah, that's beautiful. So what about what are some ideas around, you know, I've spoken to traders and, you know, they've been trading for a while. And where they're struggling is is around trade compliance. So, you know, they have their trade plans set, set out. They're all written down. And that's obviously quite rare. Not <laughs> Most traders don't have a trade plan even in place. But... You know, they have these really good intentions of following the trade plan, but when it actually comes to game time, everything, everything seems to fall apart, and they can't seem to comply to those trades that they really need to be taking or, or want to be tra- taking. Do you have any ideas around enforcing or somehow, you know, uh, managing trade compliance? 
Well, I mean, really what you're talking about is having leverage. Um, you know, the reason we don't speed is because there's a police officer in his mm. car uh, with a radar gun pointed at you. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd all speed. Uh, in trading, there's no, there's no one that's going to get mad at you. Uh, your bank account will dwindle. Um, I find that, uh, you know, in, in, if someone's married, it's not a bad idea to have their spouse check their trades and um, be, because there's a level of respect typically there that you don't want to disappoint your spouse perhaps. Yeah. Um, you could do that with friends. So, you know, uh, I used to meet with a couple of guys on a, on a weekly basis and we'd talk about trades and we'd kind of, you know, give each other trouble when we saw that person breaking rules and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I, I guess you, you have to, I, I'll often joke that if, if I break rules, I'll do push-ups. And, you know, I, I sometimes run a live trading webcast on my website. And, you know, I think people think I'm kidding, but I'll actually put down my, my microphone and actually do push-ups. If I, <laughs> You'll knock out some push-ups. <laughs> make some yes. mistakes because it's just something that has a physical link to what's going on, mm. right? And it also helps clear my mind. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like uh, doing a little bit of exercise quickly to get your mind clear. So yeah. I mean, these are all tricks and things you have to do. But at the end of the day, you just have to write down that plan. And if you're not following the plan, you have to understand why aren't you following the plan. Is it because you're taking too much risk? Is it because there's a lack of confidence in your plan? If so, maybe you need to test your plan more so you believe in it. Yeah. Uh, you got to look at the root cause of your problem. And it usually comes down to simple fears that you have to overcome. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, we, you know, we talk a lot about how trading is a performance activity. So, and you just talked about push-ups. So what do you do to get yourself in, in the best kind of peak state for trading? You trade intraday, every day. Is there some sort of routine that you, that you have to, to make sure that you're ready to turn it on when you need to turn it on? especially if it's like 3.30 in the morning when trading in, in Maui? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I have lots of things that I do which people might be surprised about. Yeah, I'd love I, to hear uh, it. I, I'm quite active. I, I do a lot of exercise. I love to cycle. So, nice. you know, I, I try to always stay in shape, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, because I think your mind is sharper when you're in good condition. Yeah. Um, I do meditation. There's a, a product out there. I think it's called Muse. It's a little yeah. headband that you yeah. wear. And it uh, measures your brain waves, and you there's an app on your phone, and and it basically plays the sound of the ocean in your ears while you uh, try to relax and calm your mind, and it reminds you with sounds in your ear when you are not being relaxed and calm, and then when you are, it has little birds that chirp in your ear, and that's a great little tool, you know, a three hundred dollar piece of hardware that you strap to your head, and you look kind of funny, but. It um, meditation has huge benefits, mm -hmm. in, or at least I believe it has huge benefits in terms of your overall health and and mental wellness. So that's yeah. something I do. Um, I I do uh, mind like brain puzzles, uh, mind games. You're probably familiar with Lumosity. It's a sure, yeah. a website where you can uh, measure your, I think your, I don't know if it's IQ, but some sort of measure of intelligence. But you can actually improve it over time by playing these games. So that's actually what I do every morning when I wake up. I, mm. When my uh, alarm goes off, which I set on my, my iPhone, um, I open up the Lumosity app and I do some brain games. There's one where you have to park a bunch of trains in their train houses according to their color. And it, you have to do it very quickly. And it just gets my brain moving. And, um, and then I'll hop out of bed and try to you know, do a few just quick exercises just to get the blood flowing and that kind of thing. And, like stretching uh, or yoga? Push-ups? Uh, I do that, yeah. yeah. I, I actually don't like yoga, but I feel great when I do it, so <laughs> I do that as well. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of stretching because I'm terribly inflexible. And one of the things, when you sit in a chair yeah. all day trading, it's really not good for you. Yeah. Um, I actually, at my home, I have a desk that goes up and down so that I can stand in front of it rather than always sit. Yeah, I saw you and post a picture of that on Twitter a while back. Yeah, that's right. Like so nice that desk. has a that has a huge benefit for your health, I think. And even when I am trading, like here where I am in, in Hawaii right now, I don't have that desk. So I make a point of trying to stand up every hour. You know, I have my, my Apple Watch that reminds me I'm supposed to stand up every hour. And uh, just try to keep your mind active. Um, I also have noise-canceling headphones that I wear uh, just to really get focused. Mm. Uh, it's so easy to miss out on trades if, you know, I have three kids and I'm, you know, in a in a home where I don't really have an office, so I'm, you know, it's beautiful. I'm sitting literally 
uh, a nine iron from the ocean. But um, at the same time, I got my kids bugging me sometimes, and they know that if I have my headphones on, they're supposed to leave me alone. So <laughs> um, it's it's just another way to sort of block out the outside world. I'm gonna have to incorporate that trick. When Daddy wears his headphones, that means do not bug him. <laughs> so yeah, that's, it's, a, that's a good one. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good one. And what do you think about Muse? I've played with that before, but I've never tried using that while trading. Do you wear that while trading or is it just more to get no. yourself kind of, yeah, more mindful and yeah, more no. peaceful before you start trading? Yeah, no, it's just, you know, they, they say you should meditate twice a day for 15 minutes. I don't do it twice a day. In fact, many days I don't do it, but um, I do try to do it. And it's something you have to learn how to do. Yeah. It, it's actually kind of hard at first mm -hmm. to actually calm your mind. But um, when you do it, you actually feel quite energized. And when you actually do it well, it, it really... Uh, sort of centers your body and or your mind I guess and yeah. uh, just makes you speak or think more clearly and and be better focused and all the things that we as traders need to be to do well so true it's so you know fascinating because probably about half of the guests I've had in the show also meditate so certainly I think traders you know they've realized there's a real power to meditation we've talked about it numerous times on the podcast already about just how how much it can influence someone's decision making process and and you know just the emotional process as well um, yeah, you know, it's funny. Three years ago, I, if you told me you should meditate, I would have said, get lost. <laughs> That's <laughs> for phone. hippies, you know. But <laughs> yeah. um, you, you have to really try it and, and, and try it successfully to really get why it works. Yeah. And it uh, really energizes you and, and clears up your mind. Yeah. That's the, that's the funny thing with traders is that I think some of us are wired to, to expect some sort of, sort of immediate ROI out of meditation. Like, okay, I'm going to invest 30 minutes, and that means I expect to have at least, you know, uh, 500 bucks coming out of the market because I meditated, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work quite that well. <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way, no. But I think if it's something that you make part of your routine, yeah. you know, like I talk about all these things are in my routine. I, I bike ride, I, I, you know, do exercises, I stretch, I eat well. Um, I, I really avoid sugar. That's mm -hmm. another, I didn't talk about that. But, uh, you know, you try, everyone should try not going on sugar or having no sugar for one, one week and see how they feel. And I'm not talking about fruit because natural sugar is okay. It's attached to fiber and it gets digested differently than eating a, a chocolate bar or drinking fruit juice is, is also not good for you. So yeah. um, I you know, just said, I'll try it for a week. I didn't have any sugar and it was hard because you really crave it. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you get over that hump of, of craving it, um, it's amazing how much and more energy you have. And, and of course, the effect on your physical self is Absolutely. quite profound as well. Yeah, I didn't know we are going to go in this direction, but uh, I'm happy to brought that up <laughs> because I actually did a pretty cool experiment last, last year. You know, I went on a, a ketotic diet, so nutritional ketosis, where basically, yeah. you know, you don't eat any sugar at all. I kept it to under 30 grams of carbohydrates per day, yeah. 50 grams if I was doing, maybe 50 to 70 grams if I was doing a lot of activity. And man, after you get over that first little hump, which is, for me was about four weeks when you kind of get that, they call it the, um, what is it, the, the low-carb flu. Um, after that, you just feel like your brain's on fire. Once the ketones start to generate and uh, you're being able to mm. you know, pull energy from those fatty acids, then wow, you feel really, really alive. Um, yeah, my wife has done that uh, mm. as well. I haven't done it, but um, I, I watched her go through it. And I mean, she was pretty grumpy for the first little while. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you do feel it. But it has, it has a dramatic <laughs> effect on your physical body. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, again, just clears your mind. Uh, she's way more calm and relaxed. and. So I do think there's a benefit to these things and, um, you know, don't be afraid to try new things, but don't be silly about, there's a lot of stupid stuff that people on the internet try to talk <laughs> about. Right. Uh, but simple, I, I mean, I think we would all agree that sugar probably isn't great for you, so yeah. try not having sugar. Um, try not eating processed food, those kind of things. And I'm all about making money. I mean, I'm not some hippie tree hugger type person. That's not my style. I race around in Ferraris and you know, I have, I don't have that typical outlook, but I, I want to be healthy and I want to make money in the market and anything I can do to give me an edge is something I'm going to try. Absolutely. And so it sounds like, you know, that, that, that set of routines you have, this, that ritual you have in place to kind of prime yourself for the day. You know, I just want to thank you for sharing that because it sounds like you, you got a really interesting, you know, set of rituals that you do to kind of get you ready for the day. Yeah. So what about, uh, you know, just talked about edges. So what do you consider to be your own personal edge? So what is it that, that you're bringing to the table with trading that's maybe unique to, to you? Well, I've written my own indicators. I use TradeStation for day trading. Um, I don't execute my trades through TradeStation, but I use it for my analysis. 
and I don't use any commonly used technical analysis indicators um, because I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. So I wrote my own. Um, they're centered around the abnormal activity concept that I talked about earlier. They're also the basis of what we do at Stock Scores. Um, at StockScores.com, you'll get abnormal activity on a daily interval, so it's more useful for position or swing trading. It has some use for day trading as well, but when I'm actually day trading, I'll, I have these proprietary indicators that I've programmed in TradeStation that just allow me to find things before anyone else. And you know, I can find something and then see the crowd pile in after me um, because they've, they're also looking for the same thing. They just don't have maybe the tools to find it as quickly as I do mm. and process. Um, not, it's not just the indicator, but also the process, the step-by-step -step process I go through. And those are things that I'll teach my students, but I really don't share them otherwise. Yeah. And it's uh, you know something that there's a small number of people using. I don't teach a lot of people on a regular basis. So, um, But for those of us that are able to use those tools, they, that gives us an edge. And I think my other edge is just experience. I've done this a long time. And, mm. You know, not to say I don't make mistakes, but when I make mistakes, I know what I did and I know how to fix it because right. I've been through it so many times. Yeah. So what does your average trading day look like then? So it sounds like you trade, you know, pretty much every day. If there's good opportunities, you'll, you'll be lazier if there's <laughs> less opportunity. Yep. But what does your average trade day, trading day look like? So let's say you're at home and not, not in Hawaii. When do you get up and when do you wrap up for the day? So I'm usually sitting at my desk maybe 15 minutes before the market opens. Honestly, sometimes it's two minutes before the market opens. I don't do any pre-work. I don't look at the news or what happened pre-market. Um, I'll sometimes flip through Twitter uh, lying in bed as something I'm just more curious about because yeah. I follow you know, some, some economists and guys like Jim Cramer who are you know, knowledgeable. I don't really see a lot of value in the in the information, but I'd like to know what people are talking about. So I'll I'll maybe do that a little bit, but I really don't, you know, build a pre market watch list or something like that. Because I wait for the market to open and, and it'll tell me what's hot and what's right. moving. Um so once the market opens, I just start my process. I have a you know, I don't know, three or four steps that I go through to build my watch list of stocks. Um, I have a watch list for swing trading. I have a, and, and a process for swing trading. I have a watch list and process for day trading. And so, for example, when I'm day trading, I start with a watch list of stocks that are trading abnormally. And then I monitor those stocks for my entry signals. So I have just you know, some simple rules that I look for for when to buy. And when um, I, I've actually got them alarmed in TradeStation so that if one of the stocks on my list uh, triggers one of my symbols it'll, or signals, it will ring a bell and, and a little window pops up. And then I look at that stock for some visual inspection of the pattern to make sure it has what I want, and then I'll execute the trade. Of the alarms that come up, the majority I don't take. So there's still an element of human judgment that I'm putting through there to actually pick the ones I want to take. Yeah. Um, and then with swing trading, I'm looking for something called an action candle, which is uh, just, I'm looking for stocks that nobody cared about that all of a sudden somebody cares about. Uh, so, for example, yesterday, uh, WPCS is the symbol. I don't even know what their name and company is, but um, it wasn't doing anything for the first hour, and then all of a sudden it came alive with volume and price. And my algorithms that I've written find that for me quickly. Uh, but I have to do the process. So it's like every few minutes I'm running that process. Uh, I'm more active in the first hour. Through the middle of the day, you don't have to be as active. Uh, but I just basically do that all day. I don't really get up from my desk too much. If I haven't taken any trades by, say, the two or th second or third hour of the day, and it just doesn't look like anything's going to happen, sometimes I'll, you know, go do something else. But it seems like every time I do that, something comes alive at <laughs> sure. two o'clock Eastern time, and it makes a big run into the close. So yeah. you never know, right? Like there, are, there's been many times where I've said, "Ah, the days are right off," and then I miss out on a big winner that just came alive late yeah. in the day. So you really have to have that discipline and focus to um, stick with it, and it's tough when you're. You know, like I said, I'm in Hawaii right now. It's kind of hard not to want to go, not, you know, scuba diving in the, the ocean beach. or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's the challenge you face. So do you? So do you have any rules in place where you're like, okay, if I'm if I'm up a certain amount or I've taken a set number of trades by, like you said, the second or third hour, then maybe I don't need to look at the markets in in the second half of the day. Or are you are you always at the desk? You know, from the opening to the close. 
Yeah, you shouldn't have any rules based on how much you're up or down. Yeah. Um, it well, may be down because people tend to get really emotional when they're losing a lot. So sure. there is a point where you just want to turn off the screen and say, okay, it's a bad day. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, as I said earlier, when the going is good, you want to work hard. So if you're making money, you should actually be working harder because obviously mm -hmm. the market's, you know, has good follow through that day. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a loss limit, let's say you don't, let's say your risk tolerance is $100 and you've lost $500 for the day, so five times your risk, you know, it's not a bad idea to have a turn off the computer point um, because otherwise you'll start to break your rules because you're trying to make back your losses because you right. want to take away the pain that you're feeling. Yeah. Um, and that's dangerous. But I, I don't think it's wise to ever say, well, I'm up 5000 so I'm going to quit for the day and go shopping because uh, you could be up 10000 You got to remember your good days got to pay for your bad days. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a good day, it could be end up being a great day and, uh, you know, don't, don't turn off the screen because you're making money. Turn off the screen maybe because you're losing. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. And it just goes back to, you know, you talked about before about the fallacy of kind of setting goals or maybe even daily goals, right? Like um, maybe it's best, like you said, is, is to better manage your, your yeah. losses uh, than trying to manage your gains. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and you, but again, normal human beings, we say, "Oh, I don't want to be greedy," and so I've made a thousand dollars today. That's good enough for me. I, you know, yeah. that's uh, a bad. Idea. You have to think like a computer, I think. And if your if your strategy isn't working, or your execution of that strategy is poor, then it may be time to step back. But if your strategy is working, why would you quit? It's like, right. you know, if you're at the if you're in a football game and you're up by 30 points, do you quit? You know, like you say, okay, I'm, I'm good. We're up by 30. You guys just play by yourselves and you just sit over here. I mean, you would never do that. That's, that's so uh, dumb, right? Um, and, and in fact, you see sometimes, uh, I like to watch hockey as any Canadian does, and, and you'll see your, you know, my, my team is the Calgary Flames, and I've, I've seen the Flames be up by four or five goals, and they kind of get, cocky and casual and all of a sudden it's a tie game yeah they went home <laughs> um, you know because they they gave up they yeah. quit so you don't quit when you're winning you quit when you're losing maybe um just to try to manage the loss i guess yeah and so what's your perspective so why you know it sounds like you're using algos as decision support why not go full automated and just automate your strategies completely do you still believe in that kind of human element and look that human you know uh, element of visually inspecting those patterns before executing what are your thoughts around that? yeah I, I haven't defined my rules well enough yet where i could just let the computer do it hmm. and some of my rules require are, are using patterns and the patterns are a little bit hard to program yeah oh, an ascending triangle you can look at that on a chart and say that's an ascending triangle right. but to tell a computer how to recognize an ascending triangle i haven't figured out how to do that so yeah uh, and and not to say that i only trade ascending triangles but i'm just trying to point out that I still have that experience of looking at a chart and being able to say that's good. I'm sure that if I had a PhD in math and a PhD in computer science, I could probably program those things, but I don't. So um, I have to still do some of it manually. And that's, it just seems like that's the, the direction things are going. And, you know, we, we kind of talked about this before, before we launched in the call today, but what are your thoughts now around, you know, the, the market being kind of overwhelmed with these HFTs and algos? Do you think it makes it harder for traders. What are your opinions around uh, around that aspect of trading? Um, you know, most HFTs are competing on time, mm. so they're trying to be faster and faster, and they basically killed the the scalping game. Yeah. So when I started day trading, um, the game was to scalp. I never did it, but that's how lots of people traded. They would do 500 trades a day, trying to make a couple cents each time by trading the bid ask spread. That game has been taken away by HFT because the computer can just do it so much more quickly. And so all the scalpers, in my mind, are out of, out of business. Now, there may be someone else's definition of scalping that still works, but my definition, which is to trade the bid-ass spread, that's a tough game because the computers can do it better. Um, but what you, what you almost should do as a trader is slow down instead of try to speed up. Instead of trying to do trades where you hold for a few seconds, Slow it down. I, I typically hold stocks for a few hours, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to the market. And I can see the HFTs coming in because when markets run up too quickly, those algorithms hit the bid, and, and they push it back to the trend line. So rather than chase stocks as they move up and away from the trend line, which is maybe what I would do in the past, I now wait for the pullback to the trend line because I know the HFTs are going to be in there supporting it. 
Right. So it's not that the HFTs hurt, it's just that they changed the market. And you have to understand how they change it and use it to your advantage and realize that they're going to be there to backstop the market when there is a pullback. And they're also going to be there to sell into the strength when there's a rip higher. Um, and so you have to sort of trade accordingly. Nice. Nice. That's a great, uh, great perspective. So we're coming up on the end of our time. So I just want to maybe just uh, fast fire a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, maybe number one is, you know, you work with a lot of traders. So what advice would you give a trader who's, who wants to go from good to great? Let's say they're already at a, you know, at a good place where they're, they're making decent money. How can that trader go from good to great? Well, you have to recognize that trading is simple, but it is not easy. Hmm. And if you're going to be a great trader, you have to love it. If you're trading to make money and you kind of find it tedious and boring and, and stressful or whatever the thing that you hate about trading, then you probably should quit because I think that the best traders are the ones that love it. They do it because it's fun. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, in Hawaii right now. I probably don't need to trade every day financially, but I love it. I just I don't mind getting up at 3 in the morning and, and trading the market. It drives my wife probably crazy, <laughs> but... Um, but I love it. And so I just can't imagine not doing it. And I think that's what makes me push through the hard times and have the determination to figure out what I'm doing wrong when I'm doing something wrong and, and to capitalize on things that I'm doing right. And, uh, and so if, you know, if you're finding you're struggling with trading, um, maybe do some self-analysis and say, is it because I hate it or is it because I just don't know enough yet? Mm. Um, everyone has to learn the mechanics of trading and that, that doesn't take long two or three months you can learn the mechanics of trading. After that, it's all about overcoming yourself, overcoming the fact that you're a normal human being. And that is the challenge. And so, you know, I don't read books on, on stock trading. I, I've never, I don't think I've ever finished a book on, on stock trading. But I do read a lot about human psychology and about fear and greed and, and uh, behavioral finance and those things because those are the things that help me overcome myself. And that's, I think, where people can maybe put their focus in their education. I love that. So can you recommend us some books then around, you know, uh, like you said, behavioral finance or trading or psychology? What are some titles? Do you have any titles on the top of your mind that um, you really like? You know, they're not trading related. Yeah, they're, for sure. Uh, like, I don't know. I uh, There was a book called Drive. Mm, um, yeah. I'm drawing blanks on them because I mostly just listen to them in my car. I you know, I buy the audio book, and if I'm on a long drive, I'll listen to these books. Yeah. But they're like almost those self-help books on how to be a better human is some of the things I look at because there's parallels that you can take out of those mm -hmm. that um, work with trading. Yeah. Um, the only book that I've ever finished on the market is Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, which sure. was written in the, in the 20s or 30s or something. And, uh, yeah. and that book is really focused a lot on the psychology of trading. Um, there's a book that's out of print called the seven overcoming the seven deadly sins of trading or something like that. I, I had it on my desk, but I looking around, I don't see it right now. Um, it's actually out of print and it's really hard to find. There's people who will sell you one on the internet for a few hundred dollars because wow. it's that it's rare. Huh? Book, but oh. Yeah. It's, you know, I was lucky. I, I got a copy and I keep it very close because I'll tell my students to get that book and they've told me the struggles they've gone through to get one. It's uh, not an easy book to find. It's All by right. um, it's Ruth Barron's Roosevelt, and, and I think that's a great book. It's not very thick. It's quite a short book, but it uh, really gets to the um, mental side of trading. Yeah. But other than that, I, I don't know. Like I, you know, I've probably given you the indication. I look at more at just big world things about being a, a better person, a better thinker, more focused, you know, whether it's how I eat, the kind of exercise I do, that kind of stuff. Um, so much of trading is just overcoming yourself and being uh, – focused yeah absolutely yeah i definitely i've found that on my journey as well you know the better human i the better person i am the better trader i become so it's certainly that virtuous cycle you feed one and the other yeah. feeds the other <laughs> yeah and if you're not having fun then you're probably struggling and you maybe have to evaluate what you're doing so true um, you know sometimes trading can be boring but um, it should be fun if it's a struggle and stressful then either your rules aren't very good, in which case you need to f either figure out better rules or have someone teach you some better rules, yeah. or, um, or else it's not the rules, it's your execution of the rules, in which case you have to overcome your, yourself. Yeah. I like that. Fun as a barometer for success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's two more questions. So let's, let's go back. Let's say you know, we go back 25 years and you had a chance to, 
to give yourself some advice um, around trading or actually around anything else. It doesn't have to be specific to trading. What would you tell the younger Tyler about, you know, the next 25 years? Would you give him any tips? Uh, slow down. Ah, don't, don't rush to make decisions. Take, your, take a little bit of extra time to think about things. Yeah. Don't be impulsive. You know, I think when you're younger, I started trading when I was 19, you, you make fast decisions because you have a fear of missing out. You want to maximize your profit. It's really kind of greed and fear mm. put together. And I find that now is I don't try to trade everything. I just, I look at a trade. I do my analysis. I slow down. I think of, not to say that I'm slow. I'm making decisions pretty quickly, but yeah. I'm going through the process that I have to go through. And I don't skip steps in the process. And if the stock runs away and I don't get on board because I'm doing my analysis and I haven't caught it, then I just let it go. The great thing about the market is there's always another bus. There's buses coming every day, uh, many times a day, typically. So if you miss a bus, just wait for the next one. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. So just one last question. So you know, if, uh, if folks on the uh, podcast today like what they heard, where can they find out more about you? Where can they follow you on the internet? Uh, well, my website is stockscores.com, and uh, there's lots of free tools and things on there. You can get the stock scores ratings. Most of the, the uh, stock scores ratings really relate to position trading. If you want to learn more about my day trades and such, then um, go to the, some of the links on the homepage are, are around my different uh, educational programs that I do. Yeah. I don't teach a lot anymore. I might do some teaching once or twice a year, so you kind of have to subscribe to my weekly newsletter. It's free. But at least there you'll get my advertisements for when I'm going to do something. Uh, and then I've also got a YouTube channel, um, stockscores.com on YouTube. And you can just do a search for stockscores.com. Just spell out .com. And uh, you'll find me there. And then I'm on Twitter as well. You can follow me on Twitter, at stockscores. Um, yeah, you know, I put out lots of stuff that are just my free daily comments and that kind of thing that I think will help people uh, learn a little bit more about how I trade and and then if you want to take it to the next level, then you can buy some of my education. But start with the free stuff and see if you like it. Yeah, and Tyler has a great weekly newsletter as well, which I think is, you know, which I believe is free. And you can definitely sign up for that. And, you know, you're always sharing lots of great nuggets. So so definitely check that out as well. Great, so, thanks. Of course, so, you like it. Yeah. So thank you so much, Tyler, for your time today. I just want to tell the audience once again, as usual, you can find the show notes, transcripts, and the resources we talked about today on the website, thetradingedge.org backslash episode 11. And before we go, I'll, leave one, ask, I'll just ask one last thing to the audience. What's the one biggest insight you got from today's podcast? You know, Tyler shared a bunch of great nuggets here and a bunch of ideas. So what would you be willing to try for the next, you know, let's say the next month or so? Pick some of these ideas that Tyler's uh, share with us and share with us in the comment section. What would you be willing to try and let us know how that affects your trading. All right. So thank you again, Tyler, so much for your time today. I really had a lot of fun. You've been listening to the Trading Edges podcast. We've taken this interview and summarized all the big ideas so that you can take action. Just head over to the tradingedge.org slash podcast to find the show notes, transcript, resources, and to continue the conversation.